welcome. Thank you for joining me in Dear Mr. Jefferson, a Conversations with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Mr. Madison and I were honored to visit the students of WordWorks in Lynchburg, Virginia, while on our way to Poplar Forest, my retreat and plantation located but a few miles southeast of Lynchburg. Today, Poplar Forest is a National Historic Landmark, which you can visit and tour. Here, the children ask Mr. Madison and I about the Boston Tea Party, and we discuss the importance of civility, that is, not losing one's temper. And we discuss our favorite books. Were you there for the Boston Tea Party? Was I in Boston during the time of the so-called Tea Party? Well, firstly, let me say, it was hardly a tea party. In fact, the only creatures I think who enjoyed a tea party were the fishes in Boston Harbor. It was a riot. It was the destruction of 356 cases of tea thrown overboard of the ships of the realm, that is, ships that belonged to the monarchy of Great Britain. And of course, those tea, that tea was destroyed by Indians. Do you think it was? Shh, don't tell anyone. They thought it was Indians. I was in uh, Virginia at that time. In fact, I was in, uh, let me see, I think I was in Williamsburg, Virginia in December 1773. Do you remember where you were? I was. I was in, uh, in Orange County and I was a member of the Committee of Correspondence and that's how we heard about the Boston Tea Party. People from the Committees of Correspondence in Massachusetts wrote to different committees and the letters finally came to us. I, I heard it was 342 chests of tea, but that's mm -hmm. probably the difficulty with communication. So mm -hmm. true. But in 1773, I was only 22 years old. And uh, we heard about Boston in Massachusetts. It's a very disruptive, it was a very disruptive colony. They were always doing things that seemed to fly in the face of the British government. They did, I believe with the Boston, they closed the port of Boston. Mm, they did. The British did not like the destruction of their property, so they closed down the entire port. Yes, they prevented any trade to come in or to go out uh, of Boston. Now, we got worried because maybe they could do that in Virginia. They could do that in Pennsylvania. How did we support them in Massachusetts? Do you remember, I believe they called for a day of prayer? I, in Williamsburg, I got together with some of my friends Patrick Henry and George Wythe, and we wrote up a, a special proclamation for a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. That is to get all Virginians to go to church and pray for Boston and Massachusetts. Even though they were 700 miles away, they were still our fellow Americans. Even though they were a different colony, we were still all Americans here, so we wanted to make sure they would be safe and hope they would uh, consider we, we had the same right. We wanted to support those in Massachusetts, but we did not want to bring the British government down upon us by rioting in the same way. So by declaring a day of prayer and thanksgiving, we could sh show our support to Boston and to Massachusetts. But who can object to a day of prayer and thanksgiving? It's certainly not an offense against the British government, but it's showing our support without putting ourselves in jeopardy. Ashley, what's your question? Um, this is a question for both, both of you. Looking back, would you do anything differently? Ooh, mm, that's a big question for anyone. If you could go back, would you do it differently? Mm. I'll have to think about that for a moment, Mr. Madison. What about yourself? Well, that's a shame, Mr. Jefferson, because I was hoping your answer would give me time to think about what I would do. <laughs> Ashley, perhaps I can put it to you. If you had it to do over again, is there anything you would do differently? Um. No. Well, I'm kind of inclined to say the same thing. There are, I suppose, if anything were to change, it would be my hopes and aspirations when I was a younger man. That sometimes I hoped that things would transpire that never transpired. Mm -hmm. Good point. And I think if I had not 
it's not that I didn't want it to happen or didn't um, do things to make it happen, good things, but my expectations that it would come to pass, that it would all work out exactly right, uh, put some false expectations in me. Good answer. I, I think having had time to think about it, I, I would agree with Mr. Madison. One thing is certain, we cannot go back and change things. Mm. Things have happened the way they are simply going to happen. And if I could go back, you won't know what I would worry about more than anything else. What could I do more to have, to have made things better? That's right, what more could I have done? Could I have treated someone more kindly? Could I have treated someone with more respect? Could I have been more civil in conversation rather to suddenly get overheated and angry? Anger does no one any good. You know what an ancient statement is? Men must not turn bees that put their lives in the sting. What happens to a bee when it stings? It, 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 it dies. Well, it dies. So you may be very angry and want to sting, but think about it for a moment. I think also, if there was anything I could have done to have preserved someone's health, by that I mean that Mrs. Jefferson, my wife, could have lived. We did not know why she found it difficult in childbirth. And therefore, imagine she gave birth to six children and she could not survive the birth of our sixth child. She died shortly afterwards. So I wish that I had known something I could have done to have preserved her life, that people who are now gone could still be with us. So you know what? I think the lesson we learn, realizing we can't go backward, is to know what we can make better as we go forward. To know new medicines, to know new doctrine, to have a greater education, to have more information, to continue to pursue science, to make things better, and particularly to know how to preserve good manners and civility. That's always important because when you do unto others as you would want to have done to yourself, you have no regrets. You have no regrets. You've done as well as you can do. Sometimes as a child, I thought what it would be like to be 30 years older. Mm. And I tried to imagine myself 30 years older and perhaps even married and with children and, and uh, other things that I would do. And when I thought about it, and I dreamed about it, and I, I reflected on it, all of a sudden I woke up from my thoughts. And I looked back and think all the things I wanted to do between the time I was 10 years old and the time I was 40 years old, there were certain things that I was looking back on, imagining myself to be 40, to look back on things when I was 15 and 20 that, I, that were really badly done. But when I woke up from my reveries and then realized that I was still 10 years old, I had 30 years now ahead of me mm. to correct the things that I imagined that I would do wrong when I imagined myself to be 40. Mm. Yeah. And sometimes when you look ahead like that and you put yourself in a position so much more in advance of your age and you go back and think about where you are right now, you have all this opportunity in your future to correct the steps and the mistakes you think you might make mm -hmm. had you imagined yourself to be 40. Very. What is your favorite book? My favorite book, Jonathan, without a question, and I will tell you this, no day is misspent when I can have a good read. I always believe in exercising the mind as well as being out of doors and exercising the body. And I would say of all of the books that I have enjoyed throughout my entire life, the book called the Life and Times of Tristram Shandy, or The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, remains my favorite. It was written by a gentleman named the Reverend Lawrence Stern, and it is a book about the birth of a little baby boy named Tristram Shandy. But imagine this, more than half of the book, he is not born yet. Now, how can the, be, the book be about him when he's not even born yet? Well, the book is really about his family and the world into which he will be born. So that makes you think right away. Well, he's not even here yet. How does he know? 
but the reader has the advantage. The reader knows. And then finally, when Tristram Shandy is born, you realize that he may have a very different opinion than what you have already read are the opinions of his family and his neighborhood. Another thing, too, that Tristram Shandy does, it opens your mind into great imagination to realize that you're actually having a conversation with the author of the book because you're reading and as you turn the pages, suddenly you turn the page, there's nothing on either the page on your left, the page on your right. You think there may be a mistake. You turn the page and the author, the Reverend Stern, tells you, I beg your pardon, dear reader, my mind drew a blank. <laughs> You're having a conversation with them. Uh, you, sometimes you're reading and suddenly you realize after several pages, this is the same sentence. The sentence keeps going on and on and on and on and on. Finally, you turn the page, there's nothing on it but a period. <laughs> then you turn some pages and there are no words. They're drawings and doodles, scribbles. Scribbles, and the Reverend Lawrence Stern says, I beg your pardon, reader, I became tired of writing. I thought I would draw. So you see, you're actually having a conversation with the author as you're reading, and there's several different things going on. I find it a book of great imagination. It helps us go outside of the box, so to speak, to use our imagination. And I think we're a nation that really provokes imagination, the, the thought and the number of ideas that we can have. What's your favorite book, Mr. Madison? Well, that is hard to describe because I read one book and I am very much enthusiastic about it. And then I read another book and realize I'm more enthusiastic about the next book. And then I read a third book and I realize I'm more excited about that book. One of the collection of books that I like to read were a series of books written in the early 1700s, long before I was born. But they are a series of essays, maybe two or three pages each. And they're put in a collection called The Spectator and The Guardian and The Tattler. And there are six volumes in The Guardian and two volumes in The Spectator, or the, uh, two volumes in The Guardian and six volumes in The Spectator, and I believe three or four volumes in The Tattler. You mean a tattler, like someone tattletales? Very much a tattler, yes. And these, these, every day is a new essay. So you can read various ideas each day. You can find August 24th in 1712 and read two or three pages and that's the essay. And it might be on winking at young ladies. And then you turn the page and it might be the way a person um, conducts himself when he gets off a wagon. And it, just many, many different subjects. Every day it's a different subject. But the way these articles are written is very, very good English. They are very, very well written. And there was Addison, and there was Steele, and there was Swift, and there was Alexander Pope. And all of these men contributed to this collection of works. Jonathan Swift is Jonathan the, Swift. You know who Jonathan true. Swift is. He wrote the book called Gulliver's Travels. Uh, Have you heard about Gulliver's Travels? Yes. Uh, where they go to the land of the Lilliputians? Yep. Very tall little people. That's Jonathan Swift who wrote that great imagination. Yes. Was being president hard work? Um, the young lady has asked uh, us, Mr. Madison, is it hard being president? And I can only answer, I cannot think of any other job that would be harder than being president. And my question then to you is, why? Why do you think it is hard being president? Because you have to take care of the other people. You have to make decisions that um, some people are not able to make. That's right. You have to make decisions on behalf of all of the people. Do you think that being president, you can make everybody happy all the time? No. 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 That's an impossibility. So you've already failed in your job to make everybody happy, but can you make some of the people happy some of the time. Yes. yes, you can. That is something you can achieve as president. And remember too, when you're president, you're a public servant. Your time is not your own. Your life is not your own. You're called upon all the time. You might have been days and days without proper sleep. 
Suddenly you feel you have the opportunity to enter your slumbers peaceably for a long time when you're called upon. You're called upon, you must get up and attend to the concerns of the people. So it's a very difficult job. Would you not agree, Mr. I would. When I woke in the morning, I used to read the uh, gazettes from the previous day, and then I would go through the correspondence, many, many people writing to me. And they all required a response. And you'd have to write the letter back. And then maybe you have time for a, to break your fast from the evening th before, and, and so we call it a breakfast or so on, to have a little bit of bite to eat. And then I'm there to receive someone who has been so anxious to get a position as the postmaster in Vermont. And he wants to say that he's the best postmaster this little town in Vermont can ever have. And then the next moment, someone comes in with military reports from the North regarding the war in Canada and how the generals are doing. And then you have something from the Congress that requests you for a financial report from last year. And then the next day, you, the next moment, you have another one coming in and asking for uh, a post to be a council in, in Bordeaux and another person that wants money for the national government for something they did during the revolution. And then in the evening, Mrs. Madison wants to have a levy. Mrs. Madison wants everyone to come to the White House, to the president's mansion, and gather for, for tea and for coffee and to talk about things. And it is so laborious. I beg your pardon people. for interrupting, but I, I have to say, everyone wants something from you. Precisely. Thank you. 